Welcome. I'm glad that you could join us. Uh, I'm here with uh, Dr. John Byron. Dr. Byron is uh, Dean of Ashton Theological Seminary. He is also Professor of New Testament and Greek. And today I'm going to be talking to him about his book, A Week in the Life of a Slave. John, welcome. Thank you for Thank joining you, us. Thanks. Good to be here. Glad to have this chance to talk about the book. Good. Well, at, you know, as I have told you, I enjoyed reading it. I'm not one that that generally reads novels. You know, I like to read a good biography. And uh, when I read this book, uh, it, I, I got drawn into the story very quickly. Um, and so I appreciated it. I enjoyed reading it. And, and it um, even comes with pictures. So, you know, it, you know, it does come with pictures, yeah. which, by the way, I thought was um, uh, a fascinating part of the book. Because within the narrative of the book, you put in these um, these blocks with uh, important historical background and photos that go with it, and it helped illuminate for me anyway uh, some of the story and how it would have related historically. So I appreciated that part. Uh, let me begin by asking you to tell us a little bit about the research you've done in this area, because I know it's been pretty significant. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I've been working on uh, slavery in the New Testament for most of my career. Um, it actually began uh, as a fascination uh, with the letter to Philemon during a family devotion time. Um, it, was my, it was my family's practice to uh, have a devotion time around the kitchen table every morning. And uh, one day, I remember my father decided to lead us on, uh, to lead us and teach us about the book of Philemon, Paul's letter to Philemon, which at that point, whatever age I was, maybe 13 years old, I don't think I'd ever heard of the book, let alone read it. Um, and he was, as he was talking, um, he was using a commentary, uh, which is called the, the Interpreter's Commentary in the Bible. It was published in the early 60s. My dad was in seminary at the time. And he was using a, uh, an interpretive, uh, a commentary that came from an interpretation from John Knox, uh, not the reformer, but the 20th century New Testament scholar. And I, I gotta say that letter just captured my attention uh, that Paul took the time to write uh, to Philemon about a fugitive slave to intercede on his behalf. And then the other thing too, is just all the unanswered questions about the letter. Um, where is Paul imprisoned? Uh, why is Paul imprisoned? Uh, how did Philemon, or excuse me, how did Onesimus, after he flees from Philemon's home, how does he come in contact with an imprisoned apostle while he's a runaway slave? And then how does an imprisoned apostle send back a fugitive slave to his master carrying this letter? Um, and then what was the results? Uh, we have Paul's letter to Philemon, but we don't really know what happened. Uh, sure, people have surmised throughout history, but we don't know. And then, of course, the question then is, whatever happened to Onesimus? So, you know, that, that pretty much lays out some of the, other, I would say, many questions that people may have about this letter. Um, and that, that really just began to fascinate me, to be quite honest with you, Matt. Um, I remember when I was in Bible college, I did a little bit of work on this topic, uh, on Philemon. Uh, but then when I was in uh, my graduate program in seminary, um, I actually wrote my, uh, my master's thesis on Paul's letter to Philemon, uh, trying to answer many of these same questions. And then eventually, when I went on to do my PhD, um, I was interested in expanding a little bit more widely uh, the idea of what does it mean to be a slave of Christ, not just simply talking about slavery in the New Testament. And so that's where I did my work on slavery metaphors in Paul. What does it mean to be a slave of God or Christ? Um, but along the way, I've been, you know, interested in working on slavery. I've written many articles and obviously a couple of books. Um, this book actually was birthed while I was in Turkey um, on, a, on a trip and had just come out of Ephesus. The visiting the site was on my way to Colossae Laodicea area and my imagination was just captured uh, by what I'd seen and I began kind of writing in the van as we were traveling the beginnings of this narrative trying to capture that description of Ephesus that I have later on um, and yeah that was the beginnings of it so 
Well, it, you know, it's an interesting, uh, the story, the way you lay it out is quite interesting. In fact, some of the questions that you were saying that, that really come up when you read Philemon, you really do construct a narrative to kind of give us suppose an answer to that, right? And so, so when you get into this, and, and, and I want to say this for the benefit of the hearers who have not read your book yet, is that you really construct this narrative uh, the way I read it, where you're, you're giving us the possibilities of how different people would have been drawn into the story about Onesimus uh, running away from Philemon from how he gets to Paul and how he encounters people like the prison guard who is a former uh, slave, um, how he encounters people in Philemon's family and how all of this, how all of this um, could have gone down really in a sense uh, to, to, um, you know, to, to think about how this story would have unfolded. Uh, it does leave a lot of unanswered questions. And you do get drawn into the story very quickly, at least I did. And one of the things, John, that, that not only does it illuminate um, the plight of a slave in ancient Rome, but it also gives us a lot of insight into just everyday life in ancient Rome. You kind of get this picture of, you know, you talk about the merchants and, and the slaves and where are they working and what are they doing? And, um, it does kind of make it come alive. And so I walked away from it thinking um, that the world of the New Testament, again, it, it's a complex world. And often we don't think about that complexity. Right. Yeah, I definitely wanted to help my readers. And, and, and I should say that the book was written ultimately first and foremost for my students. Um, I was trying to find a way to communicate history to them in a way that was, if you will, entertaining to read, yet at the same time educational. Um, and yeah, to try and describe the complexity of the New Testament world, um, it's, it's hard to do that in a class. But in the story, hopefully I was able to touch on, you know, some of that. And I, it, was, it was both a chore and a, and a joy to take all of the historical information that I had kind of, if you will, stored away into my mind over the years of studying the New Testament, studying slavery, and then try and figure out, okay, how do I include that in the story in a way that's beneficial to moving the story forward, while at the same time educates people about what it was probably like in those days. Yeah. Yeah, and one of the things that that complexity, it, it was a reminder to me as I read it, that Christianity from its beginning had to navigate itself through a very messy world. Mm -hmm. um, a world in which at that time, as, as today, uh, there's a lot of human exploitation that Christianity had to grow and Christians had to be challenged by the gospel in the midst of that social context. And one of the areas in which that they, they were challenged is the area of slavery. And, uh, you know, your, your work indicates that slavery has always been an exploitative institution. Mm -hmm. And yet I can remember when I was growing up and we would talk about the book of Philemon. I can remember hearing from Sunday school teachers that slavery in the first century was not like slavery, slavery of Africans in the United States, that it, it wasn't nearly as bad. And yet, <laughs> given the research I see that you've done, that is anything but true. Right. So what accounts for that for us? Why is it that we try to explain first century slavery in a way that makes it seem a little bit more palatable? Uh, that, that's a good point um, and a good question. You know, it's, it, you know, let me back up by saying, you know, it's interesting that when you look at New Testament scholarship and slavery, um, to the best of my knowledge, Matt, the very first time a book was written about New Testament slavery by a New Testament scholar um, was really Scott Barchi's uh, 1972 dissertation on uh, 1 Corinthians. Um, prior to that, most of it was being done by classical scholars talking about Greece and Rome. Uh, of course, you had people commenting, as John Knox did, on the book of Philemon, but to actually look at the practice of slavery and then look at the way it shows up in the New Testament, for some reason, people weren't doing that. 
And what we discovered too is that classical scholars, um, there seemed to be a level of embarrassment over what happened uh, in North America in particular, but of course, you know, slavery was not only here. It, it, we know it went on even after the American Civil War continued on in Brazil. I mean, you know, it was, it was, it was throughout the New World as well as elsewhere. But as they, as they were looking at the New Testament, this level of embarrassment at times led them to describe what was going on in the Greek and Roman world in some ways more like an like a, um, indentured servitude. Um, you know, that the people that were slaves were more like, if you will, the servants would see at Downton Abbey. Yeah, they were servants, but they, you know, they weren't really, you know, they weren't being treated and they weren't owned the same way that we see taking place in North America. Um, the situation became such uh, that it was becoming more and more difficult uh, with English translations to even find the word slave in there. Uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, E.G. Goodspeed commented in, in a short article, right? Or shall I say, lamented the fact that many of the new translations that were coming out were substituting the word slave for the Greek word doulos with the word servant, mm -hmm. something that was more benign, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, because the most recent experience with slavery, rightfully so, um, you know, showed a very different picture than what perhaps what we wanted to believe and think about the yeah. New Testament. And I think that brings up an important point because if we accept the New Testament word of slave as it was understood even in the 19th century and the, rather, and the stark cruelty of the institution, that becomes a really difficult thing for us to digest when we're reading the New Testament mm -hmm. where we would like to think that everything was fine and you know slaves were different, but um, as one of my colleagues said um, at another seminary, if you read my book, he goes, it's pretty gritty. You, you, you know, you, you make it, you know, being a slave was not a good thing. You know? And that's what I was trying to do in, in reaction against that benign portrayal. Yeah, and I, I was struck by one of the things that struck me very early in my reading of the book was in the first chapter when Onesimus is brought to Paul and Paul does not know what to do with this situation, right. um, which, which for me just reminded me that um, first century Christians are same as us, is that we find ourselves in the midst of a very, again, complex and exploitative society. And that often we are confronted mm -hmm. with situations just because of the systemic nature of it puts us in an, uh, in an uncertain place. Yeah. And that even and that that where Paul would have been and and when you read Philemon, which of course at the end of your book you end by the letter with the letter, that you do read it. You know when I, I thought by the way that was a great touch to put that part at the end where all of a sudden you are now reading this letter in a context that does make a lot of sense, and then you can start to say to yourself, you can start to see why Paul would have been so careful in the way he worded some of this. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I don't, you know, you say Paul doesn't know what to do. And I agree. I, I did that purposefully because one thing I try to tell my students is, um, or I, I encourage them to resist is the idea that if you will, Paul came off the Damascus road or the church came out of the day of Pentecost and they had all of their theology formed. They knew exactly how to respond to everything. And the truth of the matter is the New Testament shows us the early church's theology in development. And, you know, it's not that the church may not have had scripture, the teachings of Jesus, and maybe even some theological principles, but every day we see this in Paul's letters, new situations come up. He's got to figure out how to deal with it. Yeah, it's a, it's a very pastoral situation, right? Pastors, yeah. you know, the, the uh, gospel message applied to a messy society mm -hmm. um, and speaking up for justice and, and fairness um, sometimes is not, it, it, it doesn't come to us naturally or easily. Right. So yeah. very, very good. Um, one of the things that, you know, talking about slavery, and, and this was one of the um, blocks that you had had in the book where you, you have a photograph of a collar that a slave would have worn that basically was really almost like an ID collar, right? That this is who I belong to. 
And it's just a stark reminder that these, slave, uh, these slaves in the first century, these were not considered to be people. These were property. Exactly. In fact, in the legal codes of Roman, um, of, of Roman law, slaves are referred in two ways. In Latin, they're referred to as things. And then in Greek, they uh, rest. And then in Greek, they use the word soma, body. Um, you were not even, you weren't even counted in so many ways as, you know, like you counted as a human being as a body, but not as you, you, your individual personality and identity was erased, you know, which is much of what happened right here in North America. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I, one of the things that, that struck me too, when I was reading the book, um, you do, uh, you do talk about and you illustrate it in the story with um, slaves being included in the church gatherings, which I do want to talk about for, for a couple of minutes. But one of the things that struck me was that the times in which um, people who are, who are not slaves, slave owners, are talking about slaves, you know, really as subjects of the conversation, and the slaves are not really part of this conversation, right? That they are, right. they're, they're understood, their identity is understood um, is given to them without their consent. Exactly. This is who they are. Um, and, and so can you talk a little bit about in the early church when slaves were part of sometimes Christian community and Christian worship? Um, that struck me in the book. Um, and I think it's a conversation or something worth, worth conversing about. Sure. You know, it's interesting when you read um, Acts or, well, you read Acts or even Paul's letters, um, it's hard sometimes to understand or to appreciate that slaves must have been present. Um, I think, for instance, in Acts, when uh, uh, I believe it's in chapter 10, when Peter uh, is released from prison um, and uh, the slave girl Rhoda is the one that answers the door where everybody else is at the prayer meeting. Um, there's, a, there's a hint there, a suggestion that maybe she is involved with that prayer meeting. Um, but if there's even, a, but beyond that, we have even more clear indications. Um, we see, for instance, in the household codes in Colossians chapter four, uh, or in Ephesians as well, where Paul says, slaves obey your masters, uh, which seems to indicate that there is a, a clear communication going on to people that would be sitting in the congregation, listening to this letter being read. And then uh, when you get to 1 Corinthians chapter seven, uh, Paul says, were you born or slave? Don't worry about it. Um, but, you know, if you have the uh, if, if you have the opportunity to become free, then do so. So those are little hints that Paul is speaking to a congregation that includes both slave and free. Although it's pretty clear, I think, at the same time that most of Paul's words and uh, focus is on those that are the masters and free. But yet that suggests there are slaves there. Uh, but what I try to do, and you notice this in the book, there's one congregation that includes slaves and there's another one that does not. Yes. And my, my, my reason for doing that is I think that we, I think it's a false assumption to assume uh, that every time a master came to Christ, to faith, that they automatically accepted the new social construct that slaves should be included. Um, and in fact, let's be honest, with the way households worked in the ancient world, if you have a large household, if you're inviting the church and slaves are not there to serve your guests, so, well, first of all, who's doing, you know, who's taking care of the food preparations? But at the same time, you got the, the early church, the early Christians, they had to be feeling those same tensions in society of everybody has their proper role. And so now you invite a higher status guest to your house who's a Christian, and he sees the slave on equal with him. There's great cause for tension there. Um, and so I tried to show in the book one group that does accept slaves in their midst and ones that do not, and how Paul might have tried to, you know, navigate all of this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's fiction, but I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's, I don't think it's impossible. Yeah, and, and you know, the pronouncements, are, you know, we always turn to Paul when Galatians, when he says, in Christ, there's neither Greek nor Jew, male nor female, slave nor free, right. as, as a principle that Paul's convinced of. And yet, 
working that out in the midst, midst of a complex social structure, um, it, it does become, it becomes difficult. Yeah. And um, um, much, yeah. much like today. Yeah, I would be one of the people, uh, John Barkley first came up with this suggestion and, and I, would, I would embrace it, that I don't think Paul knew exactly what to do here. Mm -hmm. He didn't really have many good choices. Yeah. Um, and so, in fact, though, what we get with Philemon is really a brilliant middle way. Mm -hmm. um, and he, and, he, and he, eventually he paints Philemon into a corner to let Philemon do what's right. You know? Yeah. 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 So let, let's talk about that. I, I, before we um, leave this conversation, I want to talk about how this book can help us understand Philemon and other parts of the New Testament, which I think we've already done to some extent. Um, but Philemon, as you said at the beginning, there, it, there's a lot of questions raised in this little letter. You read this letter and, and, and again, what happens to Onesimus? Right. Um, you know, how did Paul end up in the middle of this? And, and, um, and of course, you know, Paul telling Philemon that he should look at Onesimus less as a slave and more as a brother. Mm -hmm. um, how does this, I guess, I don't want to ask this, what else would you say about how this helps us understand the New Testament and the world in which the New Testament was written? Yeah, well, I think it helps us, as I've already mentioned, helps us understand the tension that the early church was living in. Um, it's very easy for us to, again, assume the church came out of Pentecost and had everything Outline. I mean, I tell my students, there is no such thing as the golden age, age of the church. Um, we have struggled from the beginning, and I'm thankful for that because it means I'm not the one that messed it up. Um, you know, we've been fighting with that in the beginning. Um, but at the same time, as, as we look at this, um, this letter, I think we see ultimately Paul's theology of everybody as part of the family of God. This is revealed here. And, and Matt, you go back to that point, you know, he says in Galatians, there is neither slave nor free, right? And, you know, we have that statement, which certainly is used in the context of salvation, but yet Paul also clearly lived and worked in a context where slaves were still there. Yeah. Um, but yet, you know, it's interesting where Paul, the direction Paul goes in this letter, I wrote an article on this several years ago, and I found it to be quite brilliant. Paul never actually says Philemon, excuse me, Onesimus is a runaway. Um, he just says he was, quote, separated from you for a while. Mm -hmm. um, if Onesimus actually did steal from, a, from Philemon, we really don't know. He says, if he happened to steal something, I'll pay it back. Um, so Paul really, he doesn't mention the crimes, if you will, but he does something very interesting here that I find theologically is important for understanding the kingdom of God. Um, he starts off in this letter by thanking Philemon for refreshing the hearts of the saints. Uh, that word that uh, Philemon, that Paul used there in Philemon, splangizomai, is not the word we would typically find in uh, the Greek for heart, which would be uh, kardios. Um, this is a more emotive term. And so he says that Paul is saying to Philemon, yeah, you've got this great reputation for, quote, refreshing the hearts of the saints. And then he later on, he, in the letter, when we finally gets around to introducing why he's writing the letter, he says, oh, and I want to introduce to you my child, Onesimus. He is my, quote, very heart. Now, there's two things that are important that are going on here we have to keep in mind. First of all, um, when he calls Onesimus his child, for the very first time, um, at least as far as we know, Onesimus has somebody that he can identify as his father. Slaves were not allowed to identify themselves as the son of some, you know, Peter, son of Arjona, James and John, the son of Zebedee. Onesimus was only ever known as Onesimus, the slave of Philemon. They were not allowed to use their family names or identity. Even in hmm. death, I, I make this point in the book, they're still on their gravestone, even if they were freed. Let's say Onesimus was freed and he died. He would have still been known as Onesimus, freedman of Philemon. Hmm. But when Paul says to 
Philemon, here is my child who I gave birth to in chain. He is saying that I am Onesimus' father. And then he says, and here is my very heart. Now, track where I'm going here, because then he says a couple verses later, he goes, treat him no more as a slave, but as a brother. Well, Paul has already called Philemon a brother. Paul is creating a kinship tie here, a family dynamic. Paul is the father to both Philemon and Onesimus. And he's saying to Philemon, he says, he's your brother, just as I am your father in the faith, I'm his father in faith. And then Paul pulls this one more, uh, he, he moves one more direction here. He says to him, um, he says uh, later on at the end of the letter, he goes, yes, brother. He goes, refresh my heart, which is interesting because that's the way he said that Philemon was well known for refreshing the hearts of the saints. Now he finishes it here. So let me, let me just string it all together for you and those that are watching. Paul starts out the letter calling Philemon brother says, you're well known for refreshing the hearts of the saints. Then he says, here's Onesimus, my child, my heart. And then he says, he's your brother. Now, please refresh my heart. Mm. In other words, not, I think, Paul's own heart, but referring to Onesimus. Mm. And so Paul basically papers over whatever happened in the past, which is why we don't know, and rather redirects a a Philemon to what really should be going on here, and that is Onesimus's status in Christ. Hmm. And I really think that's what we see Paul doing in many of his letters. There's a lot that we can get bogged down in the social tension and other things that are going on, but ultimately the question is, who are we in Christ? Who is, you know, and our brothers and sisters one another, and how do we live that life out within the context of the kingdom of God? Wow. That may be longer than you were wanting, but no, that, that John, I, I, I'll, I can't think of a better place to, to end this conversation than with that. I don't know that, that I could say anything beyond that. Um, that's a great way to leave it. Um, thank you so much, John, for this uh, time. Uh, the book is A Week in the Life of a Slave. Again, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I certainly would, um, would hope that some of our audience would pick it up and read it. So thanks again, John. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye.